have people from uh, industry, uh, advocates. We also have um, uh, a lot of experts, people that are involved actually in newborn screening, both um, on the advocate side as well as uh, through the uh, agency side. And uh, who knows, we may have a researcher or two out there as well. So it's a very, very broad audience. Uh, I, my name is Dean Sir. I am the co-founder and president of the MLD Foundation, and today I'll be your moderator. Uh, my goal today is to uh, get us kicked off and then turn uh, the rest of the discussion over to our panelists, who I'll be uh, introducing to you and then allowing them to introduce themselves in a little more detail uh, in just a moment. Uh, the technology we're using today is uh, from WebEx. And uh, it's a little bit new to us, and it may be new to you as well. So I, I wanted just to show you a couple of tricks, um, and we'll probably get better at teaching you how to do this, but uh, just a couple of tricks with WebEx. Um, uh, in WebEx, you are able to control what it is that you're seeing. So most of you, you're either seeing a video of, uh, of me, of, of my talking head, and perhaps down below me, um, uh, the heads of the panel or you're seeing a PowerPoint slide that's titled Webinar Mechanics. And so I want to show you how to switch between those two views. It is something that you have control over. So if you're seeing the uh, PowerPoint slides, uh, in the upper, at least the default for me, was the upper right-hand corner of the screen, but wherever the, the window is that you're seeing my head, in the upper right-hand corner of that, I think somewhere up in this area, um, you will see three little heads and an icon. And if you click on that, you will switch to the, uh, the video view. And that will give you, so this is a, a test view from earlier, uh, but that will give you a view that is somewhat uh, like this, where whoever is talking, you'll see them um, uh, in, in their big smiley face, uh, and you'll see the rest of us uh, down below as, as we're sitting tight. If you want to switch back to the uh, uh, full screen view, back to the slides, oh, I'm sorry, hit my mouse there. If you want to switch back to the uh, full screen view uh, for the slides, there is yet another icon um, that's, or a text, I think, that says exit full screen view in the upper right hand corner. And uh, when you click on that, you will go back to the PowerPoint uh, style view. So you can play with that. It's not going to affect uh, any of the audio or your participation in the call. You also have access to a control panel on the right-hand side. Again, it defaults for me on the right-hand side of my screen that has some chat capability. It also has a question and answer capability as well as uh, some ongoing polls that we'll be running uh, throughout the webinar. So be sure to glance over there uh, uh, throughout the webinar if you have uh, uh, any questions or participate in the polls and panels. If you do have questions, uh, we'd like you to submit those uh, through that uh, uh, through that Q&A panel. Just by typing your question in, um, identify yourself if you could. We don't necessarily know who everybody is when you have uh, um, logged in on the computer. So just identify yourself and briefly what your question is. And Jason Oman, who's with the um, uh, Rare Project Global Genes, will be uh, consolidating those for me and then I'll be passing them along to the panelists. So hopefully that's enough of the, the background um, on, on the mechanics on this. Oh, one other point I, I did want to make is that we will be archiving this webinar for viewing later, so you'll be able to hear the audio and uh, uh, see the video later. Um, all of that information and additional links for follow-ups will be sent to you as part of a uh, post-webinar email that uh, we'll be sending out to you. So uh, don't worry about uh, scribbling too much uh, down and, and all of that um, as we go through here. We'll also make the PowerPoint available for you as well so that you'll have these reference slides for for viewing later. So with that, let me uh, introduce our panelists this morning. We've got Bill Morris. He's an advocate uh, down uh, up from uh, up from anywhere. He's on the internet, right? He's from Texas, and uh, the organization that uh, he works with is called Gray's Gift. He's a member of the Secretary's Advisory Committee, uh, a subcommittee. I believe it's the Education Subcommittee, and he's a, a member of that. So he's got an inside and an interesting view into. Uh, how the newborn screening process is working back in D.C. Uh, Jim Bialik is uh, with the Newborn uh, Coalition, and he's doing a lot of work on a global basis trying to advance the cause of uh, newborn screening, uh, doing some international work with some countries, and uh, he also does quite a bit of advocacy work and, and uh, policy work uh, in Washington, D.C. He, uh, he's very engaged, and he's actually in the D.C. area. 
And then Dr. Lowry from uh, uh, California, he's also a member of the Secretary's Advisory Committee, and we'll talk about what that committee is in just a moment. He works for the California Department of Public Health, and he's the acting director of the uh, uh, Genetic and Disease Screening Lab that does the newborn screening. He's a scientific member of the uh, committee um, uh, for the Secretary's Advisory Committee. And I introduced myself. I should mention uh, very briefly, uh, Global Genes uh, Rare Project is our host today. And uh, they will be hosting uh, the rest of these webinars uh, throughout the year and into the future. Uh, we'll talk about some of those topics in a mo at the end of uh, this webinar. And uh, Shire and the Rare Corporate Alliance are uh, providing financial support for today's webinar. Uh, Bayer is a uh, corporate sponsor for the entire series, so they're doing some basic underwriting. So uh, a great thank you to uh, those that help uh, uh, make all of this possible. I'd like to take uh, just a moment and uh, uh, get us kind of into the frame of mind for newborn screening with two or three slides, and then I'm going to let some of our panelists talk about the state of affairs today and, and where we are. Um, as I was doing a little bit of uh, homework for, for this webinar, um, uh, I obviously looked a lot of different places to see what some of the organizations are doing and saying. And one of the things that, that is becoming very, very um, uh, important to know is that newborn screening is not just a blood test that's done on a newborn. It, it has uh, very, very significant uh, implications. And uh, it starts back at, uh, you know, the prenatal, prenatal education as far as what is a newborn screen, why do we want to do it, and ultimately that leads into conversations about diseases uh, that, uh, uh, that a family's child could be um, carrying or, or uh, susceptible to. Obviously, there's the screening, uh, the, the actual screening test itself. And then you have to do the follow-up in the short term, if there's a uh, out of um, out of limits rating, uh, sometimes we call that a, a potential positive. Uh, I kind of like the word out of limits screen because it doesn't cause anybody to get too anxious. Um, then there's a whole process that you go through to get to a, co a confirming diagnosis, um, and then uh, obviously then there's the long term clinical care and uh, potentially long term follow up, particularly if there's a, a therapy involved. So uh, the people that are that are looking at newborn screening are. Uh, often involved in all aspects of this, and some of them are involved uh, just in uh, particular phases. The history of newborn screening, we are celebrating our 50th, uh, I shouldn't say we, they are celebrating their 50th year of uh, formal newborn screening in the United States. And it all goes back to uh, Dr. Guthrie, who developed a test for PKU and a special process using the filter paper, similar to what we use today, to collect the, uh, the blood spots uh, from the newborns, the heel pricks. Uh, the Guthrie test was piloted in New York, and they started screening uh, at his lab in 1961. And the kickoff for a formal newborn screening law was in 1963 when the state of Massachusetts uh, mandated that uh, all newborns be screened. Uh, by 1975, we had 43 states that were uh, screening, and they were covering more than 90% of the infants born in the U.S. 1975 is quite a long time ago, so there's been a lot of uh, progress that has happened uh, since then. And I would like to uh, turn the conversation over to uh, Fred to speak. Uh, Fred, if you could briefly introduce yourself and then also speak a little bit to these next couple of slides about uh, the uniform panel and uh, the progress that we've made in getting some of the screening standardized. Okay. Well, this first slide, as you can see, is from 2001. And if you look at the code down below, you can see uh, color-coded uh, which states were screening for how many disorders. And as you can see, they're pretty small numbers back then, three, four, five, six, seven disorders. Um, and this was really, <clears throat> this discrepancy was really the impetus for the formation of the Secretary's Committee, which we'll talk about later, um, because with these kind of differences, you know, a baby born in one state, like maybe near the border, might get a test for something, whereas a baby born right across the border wouldn't. And so there was no, it was all decided state by state, and there was no organized national criteria for which disorders um, should be included in the recommended panel. Um, should we go to the updated slide, or? Um, I think we'll talk about how the panel came to be and then uh, the progress they've made. Great. So, um, so yeah, that slide then. Uh, was the reason for the formation of the panel. And that happened back in the early 2000s. It was uh, commissioned by HRSA and uh, actually American College of Medical Genetics 
did the uh, the legwork. A committee was formed of experts in in the fields, and the idea was to come up with a uniform screening panel that every state should be using. In other words, a minimum number of disorders that everybody should using should be using, and hoping that that, although it was no mandate, would sort of create peer pressure. Uh, to even things out throughout the state. So the first big task they had was um, really starting from scratch. So they got together some major surveys, a lot of experts in the various disciplines, and they created an elaborate scoring system that took into account things like the frequency of the disorder, uh, was there a good test, and was it affordable and automatable, um, was there an effective treatment? Um, and could you initiate that treatment before any symptoms appeared? And uh, was there an improved outcome, uh, whether it be prevention of mental retardation or death or neurological uh, disorders? A um, whole host of things. Uh, and they created this scoring system. And they came up with uh, the first group which they called the recommending recommended uniform screening panel. You sometimes see it abbreviated as RUSD. And initially, it was uh, 29 disorders um, that everybody should be screening for. And these, you see here, 25 secondary conditions were a second group that um, maybe didn't meet all the criteria to be in the first group, but certain aspects of them. Uh, may lead some states to include them. And probably the most common of those reasons is if it's a multi-platform methodology like tandem mass spec that can pick up 40 different metabolic disorders and you're going to get that result anyway with the test, then you can make a case for including it in the panel, even though it might not match exactly all the criteria that the first group does. So it's kind of up to the states uh, if they include the secondary conditions and how many of them do. Initially, a lot of them restricted that, but more and more they're they're adding all of those in too. So uh, it's uh, it's really worked to bring up you know a certain level of consistency across the states. And these are some of the criteria you see: availability, cost. Efficacy of therapy, availability of a diagnostic test, that's of course very important. Um, benefits of early detection, meaning before symptoms appear, um, how serious the disease is, other things like prevalence of the disorder, et cetera, et cetera. And there have actually only been uh, two additions to the, tw the 29 primary since the committee started. So after they produced the first big list, get things going, they now have a nomination process in place so that if various groups, clinicians, family support groups want to nominate a disorder to be considered for review, there's a process to do that. It goes to the committee. Um, there's a, I'm on a committee called the Nomination and Prioritization Committee, and we're sort of the first stop when a new nomination comes in. And really, anybody can submit a nomination. There are requirements. There's a form. It has to contain you know, a certain amount of material. But really, anybody can submit it. Um, it comes to us first, and we're just a group of three or four people. And we do a fairly short review process. We get all of the published materials on the disorder, the test, the treatment, any pilots that have been done, et cetera. And we have a conference call, discuss all these things. And then we make a determination of whether we think there's enough evidence there now to send it to the full committee for what's called the full evidence space review, which is much more complex, much more lengthy. Um, and we just make a recommendation to the greater committee, and they decide whether or not to accept our recommendation. So in the history of the, of the committee, some things have not made it past that first step, meaning they didn't go to full review. 
Others went on to full, full review because there was enough evidence to do so. And of those that went to full review, the majority of them have not been approved. As I said, there's really only two that have been added since the committee was formed. So it's, it's a very uh, rugged process. So, so Fred, let me just interrupt for just a moment. Um, we're getting some messages that people are having trouble seeing the slides. Obviously, if you've only dialed in, you're not going to see slides. But if, if, you, if you have logged in on your computer, um, apparently WebEx is both an application as well as uh, the web browser where you launched it from. Just make sure you're looking at the actual application itself um, and that you swap out of that video mode as we described earlier with the uh, exit full screen in the upper right hand corner. So Fred, uh, just, just talk for a moment about the makeup of the um, Secretary's Advisory Committee and what they're, obviously they're involved in reviewing applications for additional new screens. But what is their relationship to the states themselves? Um, well, there's no direct relationship with the states themselves. Um, it's a quite diverse group. The majority of the members are clinicians, MDs. Um, there's an ethicist. There's um, uh, a genetic counselor. At, Times in the past, there's been a, like a parent or family rep, although I, I'm not sure that there is one right now. And these are rotating nominations, so usually when somebody's nominated, it's for a three-year period, and then they roll off. And they try to keep like certain spots for certain backgrounds. So, for example, um, I replaced the former uh, member representing the states. And he was the laboratory director in Oregon. And so when his term rolled off, they wanted to keep that slot for a state rep. Because most of the rest of the committee does not have the interest in terms of what, how would this affect public health programs, you know, workload and feasibility and cost and things like that. So they try to have somebody from all aspects of, of the factors that would go into these decisions. Okay, excellent. And you mentioned that, that people rotate on three-year terms, but there's also subcommittees as well. And uh, perhaps, Bill, uh, might be a good time for you to jump in and talk about your role a little bit on, on one of those subcommittees and how, uh, how that process works. Sure, Dane. Uh, well, um, in actuality, the, the, there was some confusion during the setup of things. I'm actually the chairman of the state newborn screening uh, advisory committee here in Texas, and I do attend all of the education subcommittee up at the SAC DNC and was considered for a position on that subcommittee, but there was a chairman change on it, so I don't currently have an official position with it. But the way the subcommittees work, and the one in education in particular, is that they come up with a strategy and a basis by which that they can recommend things to the SAC DNC main council on ideas on how to proliferate and increase the amount of awareness and education out in the state to kind of guide the state uh, Department of Health in a way which will raise awareness. Um, that's the biggest thing that we are dealing with mostly in the uh, education area is trying to make sure that people understand the existence of newborn screening, the fact that it's not just the blood spot, it's the hearing test, it's um, the sight test that happens. It is a uh, follow-up in two weeks after the uh, initial newborn screening period. You want to be able to advise the parents that, this is a health plan for their child, and that you know, step one is the newborn screening, and then step two is the follow-up and making sure that your baby is uh, hitting all their milestones and that you're keeping an open uh, communication with your physician. So the education is very essential, and um, there's lots of great ideas that have come out there. Uh, unfortunately, from my experience in the state level, not all of them have proliferated their way down. Uh, as many of us know, in 2010, the FACT added, um, recommended that the uh, newborn screening happen during the prenatal period. And at least in Texas, it's been my experience that it's not happened to a really great degree yet. 
Okay, thank you. And, and Bill, um, just briefly, can you, uh, uh, for the benefit of the audience, tell people why you got involved in this and what your connection is to uh, newborn screening? Sure. Um, I am a parent, and I'm also a, a primary health care nurse of special needs children. I have 16 years of experience, and I'm uniquely affected. I have a 13-year-old son who was born in 1999 who was identified with PKU at 11 days old through newborn screening. So he is an example of everything that's right and perfect about newborn screening and really took it for granted that the Department of Health was doing and testing newborns for every thing that I needed to worry about, um, even as a nurse. Then in two, 2007, my youngest son, Grayson, was born, and unknownst to my wife and I, we are carriers for not just one receptive disorder, but two. We have crab disease in our makeup, too. And as many of us know, crab disease is a lysosomal storage disorder, and it's only tested for uniformly right now up in New York State. As a result, Grayson wasn't identified with crab disease, and we lost him a week before his first birthday. So that began our odyssey into educating ourselves and advocating for uh, an advisory committee down here in Texas, in addition of the maximum number of tests allowable through the program, including the secondary conditions. Uh, we got it uh, passed. Grayson's Law took effect in 2009. I've been the chairman for the past uh, two and a half years of that committee. And we're currently working trying to get the other 24 secondary conditions, conditions added. But cost does play a big role in this. We also are working through our foundation trying to raise education and bring an awareness to the community about the existence of newborn screening and the existence of a supplemental newborn screening program that they should uh, consider and get the facts on when they have children. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we jump into uh, the next couple of slides, which will actually show us the status of state-by-state uh, state what's going on in the U.S., um, I'd like to bring Jim in for a moment, if you could uh, briefly introduce yourself and give us kind of a lay of the land with some of the uh, international perspective on uh, newborn screening. Sure. Uh, so my name is Jim Bialk. I'm the executive director of both the Newborn Coalition and Newborn Foundation. They are two separate organizations, but they have one thing in common. We, uh, we try to pursue policy and education around how health IT and technology can be used to benefit newborn health overall. So we got started two years ago um, working specifically on the implementation, actually first the Secretary's Advisory Committee recommendation and then the implementation of uh, screening for critical congenital heart disease. Um, we got involved with it for a couple reasons. One is that our co-founder, Anna Marie Sarnen, who I'm sure many of you on the, on the webinar know, um, had a daughter, has a daughter, Eve, that was diagnosed at 40 hours of age uh, with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Um, while th there was no screening in place at the hospital where she was born, she was screened before she left the hospital, and appropriate intervention was able to be made and uh, saved her life. And so we learned, we learned a lot from that, uh, that example, and so one of the things we tried to do was make sure that for those that aren't steeped in the policy or understand the uh, clinical background of what's going on, make sure that the clinical decision support tools for providers as well as for parents, the advocacy tools, uh, the educational tools are all available uh, and easy to access. So on the Newborn Coalition side, we've been a part of uh, some of the state-by-state -state implementation of, uh, not just implementation, but uh, legislation around uh, uh, CCHD uh, screening. So um, the states have taken a couple different approaches, and I know we're going to get into a map uh, specifically as it goes into that. Um, but part of implementing CCHD is not just an issue of uh, mandating the screening, but also, uh, much like the Secretary's Advisory Committee, by adding things to the rest, say, we can't just do the screening, we have to do it in the context of, is there a potential treatment follow-up that's accessible? We wanted to make sure that that was a part of what we're doing as well. So we look into the infrastructure component for the short-term and long-term follow-up of kids that have been diagnosed with CCHDs uh, that receive treatment and, uh, and make sure that they're getting appropriate follow-up throughout their life. Uh, lives. And because we've been talking about this issue, this capacity to, uh, to make sure that if we move from screening to care throughout the child's life, we've actually been getting a bit of international attention as well, and specifically as it pertains to newborn screening. 
one of the issues that we've been pushing for a long time is the idea of a lifetime electronic health record, starting at birth with, with the first foundational element to it being um, a newborn screening result, uh, or in the case of high-risk pregnancies, maybe even some maternal data as well, and having that record grow with the needs of the child uh, over their life. And so we've been working on that in the United States. Um, we're, kind of, we're in the process of developing a few uh, pilot projects, but while we were working on that, we actually were contacted by several um, international governments as well. So there was a, a, a strong, uh, most recently there was a, a, a request that we come and talk about what we're, what we're working on in uh, Morocco, which we did. Um, Morocco is just now setting up its uh, newborn screening. They're going to uh, begin, I believe, with three screens, um, doing it in a pilot, uh, pilot pro uh, project, staging it out throughout the country. But one of our big accomplishments while we were there was not only to be a part of the process as it's starting up and uh, bringing people from NIH and National Library of Medicine there to talk about all the work that they had done in newborn screening, but also to um, actually do direct advocacy to the newborn coalition in Morocco like we do in the United States um, and actually get a guarantee of 2014 uh, funding for the country of Morocco to expand a single pilot project into a, a nationwide uh, screening pr program with follow-up requirements for those three conditions. So that was kind of how we got our got our feet wet with international work. Um, and then in the, in the near future, um, we're looking at starting projects not just on the uh, metabolic newborn screening side, but also on the congenital heart disease side with um, South Africa, which um, we're, we're meeting with them in February. And also we're, we're um, in the process of developing and implementing a large pilot project for CCHD follow, uh, screening, follow-up, and electronic health record uh, throughout the life of a child in China as well. So three very different populations, actually four, because the United States is absolutely in there. Um, but uh, uh, that's we've kind of jumped in with both feet uh, in the past two years and uh, made some pretty good progress. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'd like to shift us back to uh, the U.S. and some of our challenges. I think they're they're representative of some of the challenges that that are going on internationally. I guess one of the the uh, shall we say easier things is when you're implementing um, in a smaller country like Morocco, you can start from scratch and uh, you know kind of put everything in all at once. We have a system here that's as we mentioned, is 50 years old, and uh, each state has their their own ability to. Uh, um, you know, to, to do implementation. And so let's talk about that uh, for a moment. Um, this next slide, and a reminder for those of you that are having trouble seeing the slides, I'm told that uh, you're, you may have a little pop down up at the top of your screen that has the option to uh, go back to see the desktop, either see my desktop or exit full screen. I'm not sure what the verbiage is depending upon your platform. Um, and again, if you're having trouble seeing these slides now, um, let's, uh, you, you'll be able to get copies of these later. So this uh, slide here is uh, actually uh, t uh, 2011 newborn screening by state. And uh, Fred, do you want to comment on this uh, a little bit? Have we lost Fred? I right. took my mute off, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a more updated slide. And for those of you who, who can't see it, um, it's a color-coded uh, slide of the states in the U.S., and there's uh, a, a, a code, a legend down at the bottom, and the categories are 50-plus disorders, uh, which is sort of a, a dark purple, 40 to 49 uh, disorders, which is a lighter purple, and 39 and under. And it's sort of a hodgepodge. You can looks like, I mean, roughly... There's of those three categories, it's about a third of the states in each one. But I think the important thing is if you remember that first one where the majority were three, four, five, six disorders, and here um, we're looking at 30, 40, 50, and all the way up to 80. So there's been a lot of uh, movement, addition of disorders, and along with that, the, the primary goal, which was to make the states more similar, so that we didn't have these cross-border discrepancies, you know, where a child might might die in one state and might be fine in the next state just because of the absence of a particular test. So it's, the, as I said, the committee has no mandate, of course, but the, the peer pressure has seemed to work. And so I, I, 
I think this slide is is um, evidence to that fact. Um, this, although I guess it doesn't have a title, is actually a map of the implementation of SCID. And the reason I put this in here was SCID was the first new disorder to be added, uh, recommended by the panel and accepted by the Secretary Sebelius. And it was originally approved by the panel in 2010 and approved very strongly by the Secretary in 2011. And um, as you can see, we're still, you know, we're having trouble getting everybody on board. So um, not only does the nomination process take a fair amount of time, but every state has its own problems getting these things implemented. And it, probably money is the biggest one. And every state system for funding, et cetera, is different. Um, what their 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 own state by state determination of what is to be added is different. One of the things we've seen happen is several states now, since the committee has come out, have now adopted legislation saying that whatever the committee recommends is how that state will adopt disorders. But that's you know, that's just some of them. Um, for uh, sometimes there's there are issues with facilities. You know, maybe some of these smaller states don't have an immunologist to refer to, or don't have a bone marrow transplant person to refer to. So sometimes they have to team up with other states. Um, so it's now 2013, and we're not even quite halfway there. So that's just. Uh, one of the limitations. It, it it does take time because ultimately it gets back to every state. You know, they have to come up with their funding. Some have their own state advisory committees which make the decision on new disorders. Some use the committee. Um, here in California we're in sort of an odd position because legislatively <clears throat> we don't need legislation to add a disorder itself. But we're a fee-based system, um, and in order to get the approval to raise the fee to pay for the new disorder, there has to be, <clears throat> excuse me, legislation for that disorder to implement the fee increase. So it's a, it, it's kind of a, <clears throat> a two-step process for uh, for us. Um, so that's that's right. just, um, yeah, excuse me. I'm sorry for just a second. Just to give our audience uh, some, some bigger perspective here, um, we are going to talk in a few minutes about uh, uh, folks that are, that are getting diseases added to panels in individual states without going through the Secretary's Advisory Committee. But so far, we've talked about things that are initiated through that committee. And I just want people to know that um, it's a very time, not only data intensive, but time intensive process of preparing the application for the committee, getting through the committee review process, and then as this slide shows here with, um, with SCID, um, which I think was approved almost what, two years ago or thereabouts, um, that just the implementation times 50 states with all of the mechanics and the public health and the finance and so on, that also, and, and the legislative approval, is also a very lengthy process. So I want to move to um, the next slide here. Um, and this goes back one year, so sorry to mix things up. Uh, but this, um, uh, this slide shows something interesting uh, back from 2010, and the numbers are, are very similar to 2011. There's, there's been some progress. Um, the thing to note on this slide, even though the colors have changed, is those states that have their numbers circled. Um, so Montana and, and uh, Wyoming, you can see them in the, the central part here, and, and uh, some of the other states, where the, where the number of uh, diseases or disorders is circled. What that means is that the, the original 29 diseases are being screened for there. In addition to that, if the number is bigger than 29, that means they are screening for additional diseases and disorders. Um, the other thing to note on here is those states where the number is not circled, uh, because that means that the uh, entire set of 29 um, is not being screened for. And, and Fred, since you're a California expert, and maybe this has been fixed now, uh, but w why do you screen for 51 uh, disorders, at least as of 2010, and, and weren't screening for the initial 29 as a full set? 
Um, <coughs> I believe that's an error. Okay. Um, we've, been, we've been screening for the 29 since the beginning. Uh, there's a, uh, one reason that may explain that. Uh, one of the 29 is newborn hearing screening. And since that's a hospital-based test and not a blood test, a genetic test done by the public health laboratory, in some states, including ours, it's not done by the newborn screening problem or program. So in our case, it's actually even a different department. We're the Department of Public Health. It's another department called Healthcare Services that administers the uh, newborn hearing screening. So we actually are doing all 31. Um, the, I see this is 210. Uh, one of the 31 is the congenital heart defects. Uh, a similar situation, a hospital-based test, not a blood test. Uh, we didn't feel it was appropriate that our state laboratory do this testing, although we certainly report, support the recommendation. So the bill has been passed in California now, and it will be done, as in many states, uh, by the same folks that are doing the hearing screening. Okay, thanks, Fred. So the thing to look for in uh, this particular chart then is those states that are in uh, gold or yellow, whatever color you're seeing out there, that that are uh, right at the 29 uh, disorders, um, it, which is the basic panel. We see a lot of states that are moving above and beyond, and I, I think that's uh, Im, you know, implies that they are they're looking at what the uh, the committee is recommending. They're in tune with with the technologies, and obviously, I think there's advocacy groups that are that are pushing hard for uh, continued progress in, in these screens. Uh, one of the questions that often comes up, and uh, we're not going to belabor this point, but uh, what what test is actually run in my state? And a, a real simple place to go find that out is to go to babiesfirsttest.org. And these links will all be provided to you later. But on their home page, if, if you look on the uh, left side of the screen, click on the map, then click on the state that represents uh, your state, and that will give you a list of all of the diseases that are screened for, as well as uh, all the contacts for your state public health and, and the newborn screening programs. For those of you that are, that are concerned or interested in a particular disease, um, this is a, a good place to look to get uh, that information. Um, I wanted to make uh, uh, one other comment, and then we're going to uh, we're going to get off of the slides and start doing some free forum discussion and questions. Oh, let, let me jump back to one question that was uh, sent to us electronically. Somebody asked um, why some of the early leaders in newborn screening have dropped to the lower third. I believe it's a question from Heather um, in terms of uh, where they are in the, the screening process, and I think that's just a matter of numbers and timing. Um, as others, in the case of, um, I believe she mentioned Virginia, the case of Virginia, they did do the basic screening set, but they have not moved as quickly to add additional tests to that panel. And so uh, there's probably going to be leapfrogging that goes on there, but I think as long as everybody is making progress and we're continuing to help them make progress, that, uh, um, that uh, where you sit in, in that ranking is, whether it's 50 or it's 45, as long as you continue to add tests, that's probably a good thing. The, um, the one other last point I wanted to make, and, and I think, Fred, you even alluded to this in your last explanation, is uh, who are the newborn screening stakeholders? And um, this particular NIH slide, I think, does a pretty good job of, of, of showing how everybody is a stakeholder in this, not just the patient and the family um, and, and obviously advocacy groups on their behalf, but the state public health departments. Um, the federal committees, the Secretary's Advisory Committee, um, the medical providers, all of the, the uh, care providers that get involved, not just in the diagnosis, but particularly in the therapies for those that are, um, that are affected. But what about those families that get an um, out-of-range out of reading and they have to go through additional diagnostic testing to confirm or deny that, that potential uh, diagnosis? And, and you have to, you have to handhold the families, keep track of them through that process. And then, of course, this is all of great interest to the researchers as well, uh, because we're finding that as we screen for some diseases, um, very interesting things show up. Some diseases are more common than we thought. Uh, some diseases are showing up uh, uh, different uh, mutations and, and phenotypes that might be juvenile or adult onsets. So it, um, 
uh, it, this is a very, very broad impact of, of stakeholders, and, and uh, that's a good thing. I think there's a lot of interest and, and energy that, uh, that's being put into that. Um, another quick question before, we, um, before I open this back up. Uh, Catherine Yang is asking, why is there a discrepancy with the baby's first test website and uh, the NSGR, NSGRC um, in terms of conditions by state? I think the primary thing here is the time window um, between when this data is gathered. It's actually uh, surprisingly a little bit dif difficult to find just an up-to-date graphic that is January 1st, 2013. Um, and the, the second thing might be, as Fred alluded to a moment ago, um, this issue of what's being run through public health, what's being run through some other uh, testing methodology. And so they may be counting uh, this a little different. I believe from an advocacy perspective, it's good for us to have one set of numbers and to talk to one set of numbers with one set of explanation and, and uh, exceptions. Um, and so that's, that's something that we'll take note of and uh, pass that along. So what I would like to do is um, turn us open into, or turn us over into a little bit more of uh, an open discussion for a bit here. Um, uh, we have uh, two methods uh, that we've seen over the past few years of getting newborn screens uh, uh, in place in particular states. Uh, one is the process we spent a lot of time talking about here with the Secretary's Advisory Committee. The second is to uh, kind of bypass that committee and go straight to the state legislature and make this a matter of law in a particular state. And I'd like to turn this open to the panelists to, to talk about some of the pros and cons on that, um, some of the experience that, uh, uh, that you've had and your observations and perspectives on that. I don't know who wants to take that ball first. It's a little bit of a hot potato. Uh, I can start just just and I can only relay what uh, I know from uh, from CCHD screening um, but I think that we've uh, we've learned a lot in that process um, you know, the CCHD screening was approved by the, uh, was uh, recommended by the uh, Secretary's Advisory Committee um, and then the implementation process took hold after that on a state legislative basis what I would say is before the Secretary's Advisory Committee recommendation, there were several states that had attempted to implement um, requirements on a state level that, uh, that the CCHG screening using pulse oximetry take place. Um, and I would also say there's also a federal effort uh, um, led by uh, represent, uh, sorry, Senator Durbin from Illinois. Um, pieces of that were swept up in the Affordable Care Act, but not everything, so obviously there's no national mandate for the screening. But the state screening has taken hold. Um, in the past year, so this is, we're, we're basically just over almost a year and a half from the Secretary's recommendation, um, you've had nine states that have uh, passed legislation um, uh, that are, are require the screening. California is one of them, New Jersey was the first. Uh, then you also have another kind of subset of, of states that have added uh, screening to the panel via their Department of Health or their administrative process in the state. And what we've learned is that each one has taken hold very differently because getting state legislation introduced is not at all like getting federal legislation introduced. Um, you know, the Newborn Coalition has only ever uh, actually introduced uh, legislation in one state on this, and it's Minnesota, because like I said, our co-founder, Anna Marie, that's her state. so. You know, uh, Eve's law in Minnesota was was very important for us to get on the books. Of the other states that we uh, that we've been a part of the legislative process, what's been most interesting is really how different <laughs> things are by the time we get to by the time we get to the table. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with just how passionate the advocates are uh, trying to get something like this implemented. Uh, that said, each state has taken it on in a different way. Some states have added it to their newborn screening department. Uh, so it actually is run through their newborn screening department, which has its benefits and drawbacks. Uh, some of that, like uh, Fred had mentioned earlier, funding is a big piece of the, the newborn screening puzzle. Um, and so depending on when the state requires that uh, the screening be actually implemented at 100% through the state, that could be very good or very bad timing for the state newborn screening department, whether or not they're expecting to add an additional screen beyond what their budget had been developed for in that year. The other side of it is, uh, uh, like several states are doing, and uh, California is, another, is an example of that, where it's outside of the newborn screening department. 
And so the funding is kind of left in the air on that. And how it's going to be, uh, how the implementation is, is, is usually a little more, little clearer, uh, but the, the funding is not. And so there are a lot of questions, there's a lot of pushback, you know, there, there are kind of different ways that, that, uh, that, that process shakes out. One of the things I would say is that coordination is key. You want to make sure that, regardless, you want to make sure that you're working with um, not only your state, but your state of emergency department, your department of health. It's not, you know, so, so many of these bills uh, we saw where um, very passionate, like I said, very passionate advocates will say, I ran into my state senator in the grocery store and I told them uh, my daughter's story and they're introducing legislation tomorrow. I mean, fantastic, I'm glad that they, have, they share your passion. The issue is a lot of the times the way the legislation was structured was very much like the last test that had been passed, uh, that had been included to the rest. So some states we have actually seen legislation where CCHD screening is referenced as a blood test because they took pieces from the hearing screen legislation, pieces from the skid legislation, and basically copied and pasted them together and introduced it that way. Just because, you know, state legislators have a lot going on, and, you know, that may not be their level area of expertise, but it may be one of their constituents that's asking for it. That said, it's very important to clarify that so that what you're recommending is clinically correct and clear. The other, kind of, not to belabor the point, but the other thing I would say is, I think a huge part of why uh, some of the screening was not effective, or sorry, some of the screening legislation before the Secretary's recommendation was not effective was the requirements around how the screening should be done, the clinical algorithm to do it. Um, there hadn't been uh, uh, the professional academic emphasis on it that the Secretary's Advisory Committee does. And so in certain states, you'll actually see a reference to the algorithm as developed by the Secretary's Advisory Committee. Other states have their own advisory committee, more screening advisory committee, develop the algorithm on their own. And I would say without that federal piece to point to, it was kind of abstract for some of the states. And I understand that, and I think that, like I said, coordination is key because I, I, I've very few times there are instances where you're talking to someone in the Department of Health where if they have a screening that can be done, you know, they have the technology, they have the capacity to follow up, but they don't want to do it. It's a matter of doing it as smart as possible so that it can be as most effective as possible right out of the gates. And so, like, you said, like we said, you know, we, we took, went through the Secretary's Advisory Committee process, um, every facet of the Secretary's Advisory Committee process, um, including some that hadn't been used before. And, um, and now the state implementation, I think, has really taken hold. It's really kind of caught by our because um, not only do we have that federal recommendation to point to, but we have um, uh, some great examples of other states that have taken a leadership role and, uh, and been effective in implementing the screening early and often. The other point I would say, and just as an aside, is CCHG screening is particularly common as far as uh, the conditions go that are on the rust. So the number of parent advocates is, is larger. That said, that doesn't mean, you know, while often there are strength in numbers, there are often strength in, in smaller core groups as well. So, um, both are effective, but I, I believe the Secretary's Advisory Committee does a lot of the legwork that's very necessary in order to get legislatures to the point where they would uh, uh, be more comfortable implementing the screening. Okay. Um, Jim, can you comment on that a little bit? Excuse me, Jim. I'm sorry. Uh, Fred, can you comment uh, and, and build a little bit on that? Sure. Um, I, I would definitely agree with what was just said. Um, in addition, uh, sometimes it gets political, uh, particularly when you have a situation like heart defects, which is different in that it's a hospital-based test and not what the public health laboratory is used to doing. And at least in California, and I think a lot of states, a lot of the hospitals were already doing this. And although we as state employees aren't allowed to have input, with uh, lobbyists or legislators or anything like that. Obviously, private entities, hospitals, et cetera, can. And uh, I happened to, I was trying to get some information on cost. Um, and of course, everybody I knew was a newborn screening person. And so they said, well, we don't do that. You know, somebody in another department. So I was getting really frustrated at not being able to get the information. And I finally, got a hold of somebody at uh, Kaiser Permanente, which is a, you know, enclosed HMO. 
and uh, he was quite angry about the legislation because they had already implemented it in Kaiser, and they had implemented it with the same staff that are doing the uh, newborn hearing screening. And it's, uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, their concern was they didn't want the state telling them how to do something when they had already implemented it. And so originally that California legislation did send it to us. And then I think, I'm guessing, because I don't know, but I'm guessing input from the hospitals, Kaiser, places like that um, is why it was moved. That is so right. it, That's why it happened. It get political. Okay. So um, I think the, the takeaway from this is that, uh, like all aspects of newborn screening, it's, it is very complicated. It's not just as simple as uh, getting a bill passed. Uh, as Jim pointed out, there's a lot of subtleties in how uh, bills are worded and, and the funding that then may put limitations uh, back on the institutions that uh, are going to implement that, be that public health or, or in the case of Kaiser, uh, you know, a private institution. Um, so it's important that we all uh, be communicating with each other and, and working together uh, on this. Dean. Um, go ahead. Hi, uh, Dean. This is Bill Morris. Uh, I just wanted to bring a little bit of a patient advocacy aspect to the discussion on that. Um, the political is a big part of it, and it does play a big role to play in what's determined by uh, addition through legislation. But the the, the passion is, the passionate nature of newborn screening and the ways that families are affected by the diseases that they encounter on their own is also playing a huge role. I know that I have uh, felt in the past that bringing crab AIDS disease up for legislative uh, uh, action in Texas was something that I might want to do sometime in the future. But I, I caution any of us as parents and as passionate advocates to remember that with the Department of Health program that is out there, this is a, a health initiative to protect the public from something that is very significant. And with some of these diseases, we're talking about extremely rare disorders. Crab is one in 150,000. And while it is very, very uh, catastrophic to the family and very uh, affects families very significantly as with the loss of my son, Sometimes the research and sometimes the, uh, the development of treatments and things of that nature have to catch up just a little bit before it can be uh, uh, elevated to the level of a public health mandate like SCID or uh, PKU or something of that nature. I would remind everyone that we first heard about SCID back in the 1980s with the Bubble Boy uh, down in Houston, Texas, and uh, he was affected by that and lost by his disorder. And now, way, uh, almost 25 years later, we finally have SCID as a public health mandate through newborn screening with a treatment that is very, very effective. And this is what we all want for our children with every disorder. And um, while I'm just as passionate about getting crab based tested and I advocate for it in a, a supplemental newborn screening basis, at least in my state, it's not currently something that we can advocate for and try to legislate, in my feeling, to uh, force the state to test every child for that disorder. I believe that it is very important and that all the liposomal storage disorders should be added as soon as possible. But we have to temper our passion with a little bit of cold, hard facts and try to make sure that we're not uh, overstepping what the, uh, the medical profession is able to do uh, as of now because of the fact that sometimes the facts just are that we don't completely understand some of these disorders. There's other disorders besides crabes. I know that I know a lot more about crabes, but there's several others. I know he, in some cases, has uh, met some, with some resistance from some people that I've spoken with. I highly believe that it should be tested for for every child, and I passionately believe in the every child, every time, everywhere motto that a lot of uh, advocates have uh, adopted as their thing. But I would encourage for us to kind of try to change that a little bit and to advocate, become aware. 
uh, if we empower parents, there are ways that they can get their child tested for everything that medical science has uh, gotten a successful test for, including uh, the ones that all the ones that have a newborn screen with the ter- current technology. And we have a lot of more, a lot more exciting technologies coming down the pipe very soon. Thanks. Sorry for interrupting. Oh, that's okay. Thanks, Bill. So we're down to our final five minutes here, and I do want to be respectful of everybody's time. There are, um, uh, I want to allow a little bit of time here to talk about the Newborn uh, Screening Saves Lives Act reauthorization. I guess like a good DC thing, it's got a long, long title. Uh, but I would like to, to jump into that for just a moment. Uh, this, this is probably a place where it's a little bit more educational uh, to, to listen. We're not quite ready, I don't think, for people to jump all uh, up and down to, to get this passed just yet. But, uh, Jim, can you explain what that is and, and where we're at in the process and, and uh, how people can get involved or when they should get involved? Sure, absolutely. Um, the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act was legislation that was originally introduced in 2007 and passed in 2008. Um, it creates a couple of things that we uh, have been discussing today on the webinar, uh, one of which uh, was the Secretary's Advisory Committee, uh, also uh, the Interagency Coordinating Committee, which brings together um, various government agencies to discuss uh, the scientific merits of some of the recommendations before they're finalized the, the Advisory Committee. Um, the uh, newborn screening clearinghouse, uh, so baby's first test that was referenced, um, uh, as well as the genetic resource center was was created by this. Um, some people on the call may be uh, familiar with uh, the Hunter Kelly Research Program. That too, while no funds were, uh, there, there was a funding, there was an earmark for it, but the, uh, it, that, that was a piece that was kind of built and given a name associated with a piece of this legislation. Um, one of the things I would say is that, again, this was introduced in 2007 um, and passed in 2008. Uh, and I know, at least in Washington, we tend to have extremely short memories. But uh, if you think of kind of the lay of the land in 2008 versus the way it is now, um, 2008 was a completely different Congress. Uh, it was uh, some of the original sponsors on the Senate side, which I think were uh, Chris Dodd and uh, Hillary Clinton, Sen- then Senator Hillary Clinton. And you think, uh, uh, and Ted Kennedy was a big advocate there. You think about some of those champions that were originally around in the Senate, as well as uh, uh, Representative Roy Ballard on the House side. While some of them are still there, um, some of them are absolutely not. And um, one of the things that I would uh, I, w- I would say is because it is so different now, it is increasingly important to make sure that st- your stories are heard, that parent advocates are engaged. Um, while through the Newborn Coalition we are playing a role in the reauthorization effort, uh, March of Dimes as well as uh, some of the original participants in the uh, in the act are actively engaged. Uh, APHL as well will be doing a lot. Around uh, around getting this uh, bill reauthorized, so um, the bill hasn't been introduced. The, sorry, the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act 2013 hasn't been reintroduced as of yet. Um, we're looking for that to happen in the next couple of months. Um, but you know, quite honestly, it's going to be a grassroots effort from from the patient advocate community, family advocate community, um, reaching out to your member of Congress, explaining your story, explaining you know, how newborn screening has, has helped you, why you think it can help others and expand, and as well as participate in some of the events that are going to be going on here in Washington, D.C., if possible, or in your own states. One of the things that I think often is forgotten is that as much as your members of Congress and your senators are D.C. people, they have state offices, and they're there quite a bit. Um, <laughs> Congress people aren't in Washington a lot, and part of why that's important is they'll take the time to sit down with their constituents. You're the ones who got them there, and you're the ones that are going to keep them there, so they'll listen to you. And so if you can't make one of the D.C. events, please reach out to a member of Congress and tell them your story in their state. And I think that's going to be very valuable. And uh, we're, we're very much looking forward to working on this because it's so important. That said, it's going to be a very heavy lift in this environment um, because it does spend money. So we're going to be uh, working hard to, to get that done. But. You know, keep keep your uh, ears tuned in because uh, March Times and APHL are doing a lot of great work around this, and uh, um, you'll you'll be hearing about what they're doing. Excellent, thank you, Jim. 
Well, we're, we're about out of time, folks. Um, there will be a set of links that we will supply to you in the follow-up email, so I'm going to go quickly through that. Um, I wanted to just close the webinar, number one, by thanking our panelists, uh, Jim and Bill and Fred. Thank you for your time and the effort that you've put into this. Uh, to uh, Shire and Bayer for their support and for Global Genes for hosting. Um, there are um, some follow-up things that you can get involved in. Um, we would love if you have interest in newborn screening, which presumably you do because you joined us this morning. Uh, we'd like to keep you informed about uh, newborn screening issues and particularly the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act and the reauthorization. So when that time comes, we can give you bill numbers and uh, uh, information, you know, kind of one click to c contact your congressman via email or pick up the phone or, as Jim pointed out, meet them uh, face to face. Uh, there will be a post-event survey. Um, World Rare Disease Day is February 28th, so coming up in just about four weeks. If you don't have uh, anything planned for that, please click over to the Global Genes website and get connected with some others to just raise awareness about uh, these rare diseases. And then finally, uh, along with whatever feedback uh, you want to send our way, we'd like to uh, extend an invitation to the uh, Rare Drug Development Webinar, which uh, we're going to be hosting on March 20th, I believe the time, same uh, time at 3 p.m. time. Uh, so be sure to look for that as well as uh, uh, another place where you can get involved and educated. Uh, thank you all for your time this morning. Uh, we appreciate it and look forward to uh, hearing from you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.